If you've studied trigonometry in any depth, the chances are that at some point you've encountered these four formulae, known as the sum and difference formulae for angles in the sine and cosine. I'm guessing though that many people may know these formulae but have never seen them proved. I'm going to pick one of them and prove it. In fact, there are various ways of proving these formulae. You can use complex numbers, or you can use something known as the rotation matrix, or, as I'm going to do here, you can simply do it with right-angled triangles and geometry. I'm going to prove number two. The reason I chose number two is simply that it was the diagram that I first drew. The same method should work for any of these formulae. Once I prove number two, though, I will not do the others by geometry, but rather I will show that they follow as a natural consequence of number two. Let's jump to our triangle diagram now. Well, what have we got here? We've got one right-angled triangle, a smaller one, inside another larger one. The larger one, ACD, has the angle theta at D, while the smaller one, BCD, has the angle alpha down at D. The difference between those two angles I've marked in as theta minus alpha. Notice that that belongs to a third triangle which is not a right-angled triangle. I've marked in H1 and H2, those are the two hypotenuses for the two right-angled triangles. As for the other sides, I've just called them A, B and C. The first task I want to address is to fill in the missing angles. Look at the lower triangle first, DCB. It's got a right angle and the red alpha angle. That means that the missing angle there must be 90 minus alpha. Let's put that in. Well, with 90 minus alpha in position, that means we can also put in the angle next to it. CA is a straight line. That means that the angle at B, the larger one, must be 90 plus alpha, so that we have 180 degrees for a straight line altogether. That just leaves the angle at the top at A. That's in a non-right angle triangle, but still all three angles must add up to 180 degrees. That means that the angle at A must be 90 minus theta. If you can't see that in your head, then just jot it down on paper and check it. OK, that's all the information we need for our proof. Now, sine of theta minus alpha, remember, that's the formula 2 we're going to prove. Theta minus alpha appears in the non-right angle triangle, and we want its sine. Probably would be a sensible thing to write down the sine rule for that non-right angle triangle. With theta minus alpha, the side opposite is C, so let's write down that ratio for our first term. OK, well the sine rule involves two more ratios for the other sides and angles. So we'll have, for example, sine of 90 plus alpha, and its opposite side is H2. And the last one is the angle 90 minus theta, and its opposite side is H1. Well, there's our first attempt at the sine rule. I've written that down further along the page where there's a bit more room. Now, I don't really like those 90s, but in an earlier maths cast we've talked about some properties of sine and cos, and in particular we've proved that sine of 90 plus alpha is the same as cos alpha, and also we showed that sine of 90 minus theta is the same as cos theta. So let's now replace those sines with 90 degrees in with the cosines we've just mentioned. There, that looks a bit neater and more convenient to use. Let's just remind ourselves of what we're trying to prove again. Let's go back and look at formula 2. Sine theta minus alpha, and the first term, for example, has a cos alpha in. Let's see where to go from here. Well, that's convenient. This sine rule we've just written down has a cos alpha. Let's cross multiply the C up so we can now say that sine theta minus alpha is C times cos alpha over H2. That's the basic equation I'm going to work with, so I've put a red star on it so that I can refer to it later. Next, I want to look at a different triangle triangle DCA. Let's go back up and look. D 
DCA is the largest right angle triangle. We could write down some ratios. It contains the angle theta. So we could say that B plus C, that's the opposite, divided by H2 is the same as sine theta. Try and remember that. B plus C over H2 is sine theta. There, I've written that down. And now, because I've got C in my red starred equation, I'm going to solve for C in this new equation. By multiplying through by H2 and subtracting B, we get C equals H2 sine theta minus B. We can then substitute that into the start equation. That'll give us two terms, H2 sine theta cos alpha over H2 minus B cos alpha over H2. Here it is in factorized form. Notice that in the first term there, the H2's cancel. So we could now expand this, cancelling the H2's gives us just sine theta cos alpha and then we have still minus B cos alpha over H2. I like that. Sine theta cos alpha is the first term in our formula 2. We're halfway. We just need to deal with the second term. The formula 2 says that the second term needs to be minus, well good, we've got a minus, but it needs to be cos theta sine alpha. Somehow we've got to get rid of that cos alpha. It's going to happen using the b and the h2. Let's go back and look at the triangles one more time and look at one that has side b. That's the small triangle at the bottom. We could say that b over h1 is sine of alpha, from which it follows that b is h1 sine alpha. Ah, oh, that's good. We wanted a sine alpha. Let's go back and put that in. b equals h1 sine alpha. OK, so first term stays the same. Now we've got minus h1 sine alpha cos alpha over h2. We're nearly there, actually. We have to deal with h1 over h2, but we've already got a formula for that. Remember the sine rule? This rule here? We could cross-multiply it to get h1 over h2. That's taking the h1 up. is cos theta divided by cos alpha h1 over h2 is cos theta over cos alpha. Let's put that back in. So as before, the first term is already ready. Then the h1 over h2 is cos theta over cos alpha. And we've got sine alpha cos alpha. Ah, and that's how our cos disappears. They cancel. At this point, we have now achieved formula 2. Sine theta cos alpha minus cos theta sine alpha. OK, just remains to prove the other three formulae. I'm going to do two of them and leave the fourth one for you as an exercise. To prove formula 1, starting from 2, is quite simple. Look at formula 1. All we have to do is change alpha in formula 2 to negative alpha. We're allowed to do that because these formally hold for all possible angles. Let's do that. Alpha to negative alpha. Well now on the left hand side we'll have sine of theta minus negative, that's two negatives, so plus alpha is sine theta cos of negative alpha minus cos theta sine of negative alpha. But in one of our earlier maths casts on properties of trig functions we learned that cos of negative alpha is the same as cos alpha while sine of negative alpha 
it's minus the sine of alpha. So if we substitute those in, we'll end up with sine theta cos alpha, and now an extra minus makes plus cos theta sine alpha. That's formula one. Now we can get number three from number one. Number one has sine of theta plus alpha, number three has cos of theta plus alpha. But remember, adding 90 degrees in a sine turns it into a cos. That was another of those results we proved elsewhere. So let's add 90 degrees to our formula, to our angle in formula one. There it is. And that object is actually just cos of theta plus alpha. But what we do on the left hand side of a formula, we should do on the right. We need to add 90 degrees. We could add it either to the theta or the alpha. I'm going to add it to the theta. But then we have to use again the fact that adding 90 in a sine turns it into a cos. So that's cos theta cos alpha. And one of the other results we haven't used yet in this maths cast, but we have proved in another place, is that adding 90 in a cos turns it to negative of a sine. So that's minus sine theta sine alpha. That's formula three. I'll leave it as an exercise for you to prove number four in a similar way. You'll need to add or subtract 90 degrees somewhere. I'm going to conclude there.